Thank you, and I apologize to the interpreter because I only have 20 minutes um, and a lot of slides. And as the person in this speaker panel who's closest to fellowship, no insult intended, I can tell you when I actually was on the other end of one of these seminars, and there were many excellent speakers, none of the other ones are, were there at that point, but uh, Dr. Locke, I still remember. So if you go on PubMed, she said this, and I remember that, and the idea that you're thinking is not there. There could be two reasons. You truly are novel, which is not very often, or it's so stupid that it's absolutely ridiculous. So be careful, run your ideas through everyone. So I still remember that and it has uh, hopefully served me well. So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a lot of it Dr. Anime Deal has already covered in her excellent talk is about setting up consortia and why they're needed. So consortia contribute significantly to clinical research. If your goal is really to make a difference, the consortia are the first link that will tell you whether somewhat rare diseases or rare manifestations of common diseases are also being manifested prospectively rather than retrospectively. Um, so this is how you try do this. You know, there's the basic discoveries, you have clinical insights, you have implications for diagnostic and practice, and you have implications for population health. So where consortia actually go is somewhere around here. Obviously, they do not help you with basic discoveries. And population health can only occur after these results from consortia are then confirmed over and over again. So this is the major fields that you really want to do. Investigations under controlled environment, applications of biomarkers, especially cirrhosis studies, and phase two and three clinical trials. Obviously, consortia are not really immediately built up for phase two and three clinical trials. The setting up of consortia is the main thing, because once you have the players in place, it is easy to tack them on together whenever a drug company or your idea or something that you've got funded comes in, because you know you work with those people, you know how much anyone can recruit and what is the commitment. And this is not a trivial thing. The knowledge of who will actually do their best to help the consortium is very, very important because everyone who says yes can't or will not say equally perform because of many other reasons. It's not because they don't want to perform, it's just that they're so busy. So setting up a consortium is very, very important, not just scientifically, but also to prove to yourself and everyone else that this can be done. So that was a completely something that is ideal. So the reality check is very different. You really want to make sure that you actually do this. So issues in cirrhosis, you know, there's design and there's database, okay. There's patient's actual clinical trial, you have heterogeneity, you have demographics, you have comorbidities, and there's the risk of uh, severity, uh, risk stratification required because of the nature of complications and severity of illness. In actual thing, you can do all of this, but this is much more expensive. In a database registry, you can do it real-time data and risk stratification elements, severity of illness, and daily risk assessments. So this is what is good about this, and this is not what is good in the usual approaches. No. Okay. Boop. Has it gone up again? Okay. So it seems to you very daunting, you know, as an early stage person to set up a consortium. A consortium just means even if you do a survey of your colleagues in several other places to see what is their is issues, what are the issues that you're facing right now in Mexico with your liver conditions. And then you can talk to some of your senior colleagues and set up something between you, uh, you groups. That's, it's very simple. The first thing you have to answer, is there a burning question that cannot be answered by a single center? And there are so many of them. Okay. Are there any centers that are also struggling with the same issue? Okay. Can the data be collected easily? Because if it cannot be collected easily, no one is actually going to do it. That is a harsh reality, especially if you don't give them funding. Is there funding or is this going to rely on the kindness of strangers? And it's always the first thing uh, that you don't get funding. You have to prove to people. It's like getting a bank loan. You have to prove that you don't need the loan. Same thing with this. You have to prove that you can actually do this before you can actually apply for funding. So many questions in cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy and other places cannot be answered by single centers. 
There are many other centers that also struggle, except that you do not open up channels of communication. Right now, you're all here sitting in the same room together, so I would suggest that you talk amongst each other also about setting up these databases, in addition to talking to all of us as well, because you know what? When the flight leaves, you'll be left alone here. So the consortium that needs to be set up needs to be set up somewhere in Mexico. It doesn't need to be set up in the United States, doesn't need to be set up anywhere, because your problems are unique to you. And if you set up a database that is unique here, it cannot be replicated. Those findings cannot be replicated anywhere in the world because you are answering a local question for your local patient population. If the data cannot be connected easily, it's going to be very difficult, as I said. And funding, of course, helps. But as I said, you have to set up the foundation before the funding starts. So we came up with NAXELD, North American Consortium for the Study of End-Stage Liver Disease. And the initial question was, what are the determinants of outcomes in cirrhotic patients admitted with bacterial infections? So the time between initial discussion and the first enrollment was five months. So what was the reason for actually creating this consortium? It is because we found that the Europeans had created one. It's the oldest reason. It's sibling rivalry. It's the oldest reason in the world. They had created one. It was funded. It was spectacular. And we were just looking at each other like this. There's nothing. So we realized that all the, medic, all the trials that would be done and all the na even natural history studies in cirrhosis, in, in, in patients with cirrhosis, are all single centers. They're large studies, but they're all single center studies. Those are studies that actually require much more input from people who are in the field and who are interested. So we were all very motivated, which is why from the initial discussion, the germ of the idea to the actual enrollment, it took five months, which is spectacular because we were all so amped up. That energy obviously did not last because that's the first enrollment, but that, that's how it tells you how important it was. So this is the old one, which only had infected cirrhotic patients. It had 588 patients from 17 sites. So if there's 588 patients and there are 17 sites, five sites who will not be named did not enroll any patients. They claimed they would. They claimed we want to be in the consortium because we have so many patients, we can do all these things. They didn't. Did we blame them for this? Absolutely. So they did not get, when the funding came in, they were not invited. But it is important to know, because on paper, those sites were perfect. The investigator is well published, investigator is very senior, investigator is very respected, and their site has so many cirrhotic patients that if you throw a stone in the ward, you'll hit at least five of them with that one stone. But they did not want to do it. They did not have the means to do it, and they did not make it happen. And that is very, very important for you to know. So if your amigos today say, yes, 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 I'll do it, and one year later we are coming back in Cancun and nothing happens, you know those amigos are not your amigos. <laughs> you need to go away. So then we actually got funding. And this just fell into our lap because the European Griffoles Pharmaceuticals took pity on us and because we were already publishing so much. So part of my NIDDK funds, which you should not know, and uh, this uh, Grifols actually came into being, so we actually could set up a proper database. And now, of course, my phone started blowing up. You have money, so people are like, do we want to be in, we want to be in, no. So the people who were in when there was no money and present were got first dibs in this, and they actually helped. So now the question was much broader. What are the determinants of outcomes in cirrhotic patients hospitalized for non-elective purposes? It goes beyond people having infection. The sample collection also, as Dr. Anna Madiel correctly pointed out, previously we had no funding. So to expect someone to store samples, you have, you're not giving them any money to do this, store them forever and ever and ever until you figure out whether you get enough money to analyze them is impossible. So this time we had funding. So a priori we had the sample collection for stool, urine, and blood. The current enrollment, and it's finished now, is 3,051 additional patients from the 588. And this is 16 sites, but they're all sites except two or three who came in late, so we allowed them in, who actually produced at least 100 patients per site. And these are 100 patients who actually were prospectively recruited and consented. So these are the centers in Naxeld. There are two centers in Canada, which is why it's Naxeld and not Axeld. So, that's why it's, it's something very important to us to have enough geographical distribution. Thankfully, the West Coast opened their accounts because this was all a bare East and Midwest kind of situation. But it tells you that this kind of follows 
a geographical distribution of the large centers. It is still a tertiary care center database, but it's still a database that follows multiple uh, centers. So these were the methodologies. So how do you set it up? You don't set it up in a vacuum. You actually go to the people who are potentially going to review 